We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Patrick Karim from NorthstarBadCharts.com. Thanks for joining me today, Patrick. Hi, Tom. Excellent to uh, excellent to be able to chat with you. We're we're going to do something a little bit different tonight, and uh, you know we're we're just going to chat instead of what having having a bunch of charts. This was your idea, Patrick. So don't don't throw me under the bus. No charts. Well, I remember Tom that the, because I remember my first podcast ever is you you called me to uh, you beat me up. I don't know, like a couple of years ago, I maybe had like a thousand followers on Twitter. And um, I didn't prepare anything like, oh man, somebody's asking me to interview. Cool. And no charts. I think we talked and I re-listened to it recently. And I, I just like talked about stuff that was peripheral to the to trading, a little bit of my background. There's no charts. I think I, I verbally explained what I saw in the silver chart back then, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool thing, you know, to be able to uh, to try to communicate like a paradigm shift and then put in breakout lines, stuff like that. And it kind of, it kind of, uh, I miss that 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 part of being able to talk and not the like the chart and look at the chart, guys. Look, I'm telling you, man, we're going to the moon. <laughs> so, but there's trading is so much more more than that. And I don't know if we could talk about like elements that that's peripheral, you know, that uh, traps I see or like the psychology behind trading, white works, and all that stuff. There, I think it'd be a cool cool conversation. And if I could ask you the hard questions. What do you think about manipulation, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> well, bef- before we hit record, um, you know, you you and I were talking about manipulation, and there's there's so many different you know aspects to all of these different topics, and I think that that's something that that we need to be able to have a conversation about is these the the real nuances. Do we mean short term spoofing? Do we mean long term you know decades long manipulation by central banks where everybody you know, wants to keep the value of gold and silver suppressed to to keep confidence in the U.S. dollar. Well, in some ways, I think that narrative can be broken because there are so many other assets that are just beating the crap out of gold or or even the U.S. dollar. You know, when when we look at at Bitcoin, that's literally an alternative currency that has skyrocketed in the last thirteen years. That if if the government was, you know, out to get, you know, just gold. Why wouldn't they be doing the same with yeah. with uh, Bitcoin? Oh yeah, there's there's so much. Yeah, I put a tweet out uh, like a while back. I, I I wrote a stop it with the manipulation talk. Just stop it. <laughs> but I, I understand. Look, I understand the frustration of anybody who's been in anything. I've done it. Like it's that. What what you show me that curve there, that Dunlin uh, curve Dunning, thing, Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah. And like, look, that's why uh, one of the reasons why trading works is because humans, we have emotional psychological profiles that have been analyzed by, by people forever. And we all fit in that it's unfortunate, but we're driven by these, like these profiles. Mm -hmm. And I was at the beginning when I got into, I'm not saying that people say there's manipulation there at the beginning of that curve, but I remember at the beginning, I, I didn't know anything. I was just starting making money. And then I saw open a brokerage account and I went on penny forums, like, like, and uh, I don't know what, what stupid penny stock I bought. And I thought I knew it all. Oh, this guy said that this, I think it was Trump vodka or some crazy, crazy thing. <laughs> like, it's like, I know my Google, the price, I probably bought at the top. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought I was king of the world. And then it went down. And then I said, what, what the hell's happening? And all that stuff. And then when I saw your curve, so then after that, you, then the journey begins after that first slacking you get in any, mm-hmm. like in any sport, right? You're undefeated boxer, you're king of the world. And then you meet somebody who's, brings you down a notch then you, and you shows you and- shows you what you actually know right and and that's the thing like i'm not saying that there isn't that type of manipulation in the gold market because certainly there's there are market instances where gold gets sold off you know at at 4 a.m. on a monday morning when the market is illiquid stuff like that doesn't make sense i i totally understand that but um you know to to your point the the amount of information that we have the amount of stuff that that we need to learn is 
is more important and keeping an open mind seems to be a lot more important than, you know, just saying that, you know, everything. Right. And that's the most dangerous part is I've sometimes when something goes in your favor, you think it, it uh, justifies the reasoning you had, why it went in that favor. So let's say, uh, let's say I did the worst thing that could have happened to me maybe is that, that uh, Donald Trump uh, vodka, it would have went to the moon. Then I would have thought that, Oh man, uh, whatever I did there, following a penny stock for him, that's the key, right? Because I did it and I went and, and went up. And hindsight, sometimes even had stocks that went up. And then I, I look back and I said, Patrick, you were so lucky, man. Like your premise, why it went up had nothing to do. You were just in a, you just hit a bull cycle where there was euphoria, the rates were going down, money was sloshing in, even like the crappy stocks. Like uh, I read in the, the Stan Weinstein book says in the bull market, you just put the tickers on a dartboard, just shoot. And uh, you're a genius, man. It goes up. Mm -hmm. So that's why I respect a lot. Like anybody who's been like through two, three, four bull cycles and bears, and they understand that the turning points and they don't give it all back. You could learn a lot from these guys because they've actually uh, had to learn either. They had a good system and they knew that bear market was coming. Look, this, this is what's going to happen. Like, let's say, let's talk about Bitcoin and uh, the NASDAQ or whatever their U S equities. People have never, the millennials, nobody's ever seen the 2008 crash. Nobody remembers that. Jesus, mm -hmm. how long is that ago when the market crash happened? Like 13 years? Mm -hmm. Practically all new traders, all new money. Like they don't know, they don't think uh, it's possible going down 80%. And the, the US equities, people forget 2001, it went down 80%, whatever. Then it took forever to, to get back. And then 2008, they got another schlacking. Yep. Well, <laughs> so, to, be, to be fair, Patrick, you, you, you did say, you know, let's talk about Bitcoin and, and most long, longer term Bitcoin investors are used to an 80% drop, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let's, okay. Forget the 80% the schlackings, but mm -hmm. let's talk about a bear market, something sustained over a long period of time. So with TA, I was, you're able to see those long. So usually you measure, everything's measured in fiat and it seems to go, keep going up and up and up or well, fiat's being debased down and down and down. So anything denominated, let's say in the US dollar is going to have like a helping hand going up. But when you measure, let's say US equities, and let's say the NASDAQ measuring gold, you could actually see true cycles of when capital flows leave, let's say the US equities, because it's an inflation cycle and the rates go up. And then the, the money is not, I don't know for what fundamental reason, but the monies are leaving US equities and they're entering gold. Because I just did a chart, it was uh, Russell versus gold. And when the, the the gold, the Russell to gold ratio started turning down, so gold started outperforming the Russell, let's say, I think in 2001 or two, when it really started turning downwards on the hard time frame charts, mm -hmm. gold, gold appreciated like three or 400%. And the Russell just went for that entire 12 or 13 year period and went again, I think like 7%. That's a ratio chart where the US equities can go up. So the Russell went up a little bit, then there was a 2008 crash. You have to understand those type of ratios. So when Bitcoin to gold starts turning down in that favor, you have to understand that means the capital flows are leaving. So even, the, even let's say Bitcoin does go up or manages to do over the, the next 10 years, 10, 20% gains, you have to understand that if that ratio is going down and Bitcoin's going up, gold's going to be going up higher and faster. Mm -hmm. And ju just like to, um, it's hard to, for Bitcoin, it's hard because we don't, we've never seen it in the US equities bear market. Because remember 2001 to 2011, 12 was the bull cycle for precious metals versus US equities as defined by that ratio. Right. And Bitcoin came out in 2011. So it actually was born pretty much when the bull market started for the NASDAQ in 2011, 12, mm -hmm. and it's been going up and up. So the NASDAQ to gold ratio has been going up. So NASDAQ kicking gold's butt for, since 2011. Uh, Bitcoin has been doing the same thing, kicking gold's butt since 2011. So as soon as the NASDAQ starts turning down versus gold, I'm super curious to see if Bitcoin is going to turn down also versus gold mm -hmm. and how what type of headline news we're going to get saying that, uh, you know, why, uh, why that's happening. Right. Because all the premises, all those sales, those sales pitch for Bitcoin, right. Oh, it's a store of value. Oh, it's scarce. All, all, all the stuff that people are regurgitate, regurgitating, you know, oh, what's that called? The chauffeur. You told, you told me this before the chauffeur theory. Cho chauffeur knowledge. Yeah. Chauffeur knowledge. 
right? Okay, I'm not going to try to explain the chauffeur knowledge. Maybe <laughs> you could do it there. After a lot of people think they they're just spewing out, just like in the when you just like uh, enter the stock market. Oh man, this guy's saying it's going up for X X reason. Or man, until you've hit a bear market, until you've done your own homework, until you've been disillusioned, like you like you went on that slope of, of disillusion, of- you've hit that slope of despair. Mm-hmm. You just don't know, guys. You just don't know. Like, am I putting all my life savings on on the, the chauffeur knowledge? You know, and uh, I'll let you, Tom. Uh, that was a brilliant there. The chauffeur knowledge uh, theory it, on secondhand knowledge, or am I really? I have a hundred percent conviction that I have actually as many data points as I can. I understand the long term the Fed fund rate cycles. I understand the inflation cycles. I understand the gold to Nasdaq ratio, and I'm bulletproof. And more than that, yeah, there's so much stuff. Like you could look at the charts and you can know historically if your asset's cheap. Like ratios usually they don't all go um, logarithmically up, right? It's a ratio. So usually they spend time more in a linear fashion. Mm-hmm. Are you buying close to a top or are you buying close to a bottom? And I don't think people don't understand people now buying U.S. equities that that ratio, even if the U.S. equities keep going up, you're not buying at the uber low risk entry that you had in 2011 mm-hmm. and or at a 2008 crash or whatever when those ratios were at extremes right so yeah there's just like so much evidence to to, to gather and build to augment your your chances that uh man it's like it's hard lessons like even now i know whatever i know now i know in two three years i'm gonna look in hindsight and say patrick oh man you got lucky with that call with silver or like you, you were right but yeah, you see, you miss that, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So I can't even imagine myself back in 2006, how lucky I got. And uh, yeah, sometimes that's a feeling I get there with people just like uh, buying uh, all these coins and uh, they're being millionaires overnight. Like, uh, I don't think it's because it's the next greatest technology. It's more because capital flows are going into a sector, the NASDAQ, and the Bitcoin's being like, let's say a tech stock until proven otherwise. Mm-hmm. And they're just riding the wave up, which is fine. But for people on the sidelines wanting to go in, um, like, I don't know, there'll be a, a lot of uh, bag holding there. Uh, so Patrick, when there. you 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 were kind of talking about how, you know, trying to find a, a lower risk entry point. And that, you know, inherently means that you're, you're a contrarian investor. So what are yeah. some of your bull cases for gold? Like, how could we actually see you know, Harry Dent talking about $250 gold, like where in your eyes could we still be wrong in this, in this, uh, in, in our thesis here? Well, if we're wrong, it means the ratios, which we we think they're low historically, they go even lower. Right. But eventually that's why it's like, how come, how come there's not gold statues? Right. Like we told you before, like Patrick, how come you're not driving a Lamborghini if your charts are, are so good? Right. Yeah. Well, it's because I'm a human uh, I keep learning. There, there's emotions. And I'm also a victim of my own fear and greed, man. Contrary to how rock solid it looks when, with my conviction of my charts, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not binary, right? Because if I'd be 100, 100, 100% convinced, would I put all, let's say, my life savings in the call that gold's turning, like it's the bottom now and it's not going to stagnate for another two, three years before turning up? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think anybody really knows that could happen. But when I look at the total weight of evidence, and that's where the chart trading and using uh, the gold, the gold to NASDAQ ratio, or even the gold to uh, Russell ratio, uh, using the seven year rate of change. Recently, I went down that rabbit hole. These seven year rate of change is not something that easily is overturned. And most commodities right now, the seven year rate of change, or even these ratios, all the ratios that should be bullish, indicating that we're very close to a, a like a solid turnaround in favor of price of gold, they're all breaking out from below negative rate of change to above zero bullish rate of change. And these signals, honestly, they don't happen often. And every time they've off, they they've happened. And if you combine that with a, let's say a bullish breakout of gold above uh, 1350 back in June of uh, of the 2019, it adds total weight of evidence that we're much we're in a higher probability situation where a lot of the worst is behind us and that if i had a chance to play let's say i'm a let's say michael jordan and look he can't have always a perfect shot there's defenders in front 
or eventually the, the, his team's down by two or something. He's going to take a shot from the best situation. He thinks that he has a high probability of, of, of putting it in. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where gold is. That's where gold was in 2019 in June when it broke out from that huge base, really telling you that like all the, let's talk about the inflation. If I could just, you bring me back on track there, if I go too far off time, yeah. but when people, they say, ah, oh, gold's not pricing in the inflation, like all the headline news, like everything that the, the everybody that's regurgitating, oh, inflation, inflation, how come gold's not pricing it? Guys, gold's priced in whatever's happening today. It priced it in from 2019 when it broke out through that huge base when nobody was talking inflation. It priced that in all the way to 2000 and overshot probably the expectations of inflation. And whatever we're seeing now, it's, it's, it's just gold consolidating to a fair market value. Like, there's another chart I did, which was the gold. Look, if there's one chart that tracks the best gold is the US dollar inflation adjusted. So I kind of see the US dollar inflation adjusted chart, like the your purchasing power, right? And if you if you invert the gold chart, uh, it, since 1971, it's tracked it. I haven't seen any other chart that tracks. Everybody said, oh, the money supply, gold tracks, but not always. Oh, it's inflation rate, gold tracks, but not always. Well, that chart, if you pop it up, you'll see that it tracks gold pretty damn good for the past 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could look on that chart that gold actually front led the devaluation of the inflation adjusted US dollar ahead of time. So, so does that mean that there's no more upside left? Well, the upside is, do you think that the US dollar will nominally be devaluated and or do you believe there will be more inflation rate, right? Because that inflation adjusted US dollar for it to, to uh, really like go, go down through the basement floor there, the US dollar could actually go up nominally the DXY, but if there's more inflation to offset that percentage gain of the US dollar, then gold's going to go up. Mm -hmm. If the US dollar goes down, but there's less inflation, uh, that could still go up as long as the US dollar goes down more than inflation or I, I, I inverse it. But because it's a ratio, a couple of scenarios could happen where the US dollar inflation adjusted could go um, down. And that's a, that's another reason why sometimes you see gold going up with the US dollar. Oh, gold going up uh, amidst the US dollar going up. Remember those headline news and how, like how they like flipping the vocabulary, right? Or gold's going down because of the US dollar is, is going up. Like, and on a day-to-day -day basis, they could go up together, go down together. Even for months, gold could go up with the US dollar. Mm -hmm. But you have to take a step back, look at the inflation-adjusted US dollar. Where is it going? Because the US dollar could go be going up with inflation going up even higher, and gold is gonna gold's gonna love that. Mm -hmm. And so, I think I think a big part of you know that the the gold story here where you know people feel that it's being left behind or it's not pricing in inflation. Is, is capital flow, something you brought up earlier, right? Yeah. How much capital is going into Bitcoin and these other assets that you know leaves gold behind as this, this old world relic? Yeah, it's not sexy and as shiny as Bitcoin and stuff like that, but this has been a store of value over the last 5,000 years, right? And, yeah. and relatively speaking, it is way underpriced at this point compared to equity, like basically any other asset. And the mining shares are even worse, right? They're, they're terrible. The mining shares suck. Honestly, <laughs> I just did a Huey. So the, the gold sector miners versus gold, they suck, man. Since 96, rock bottom. Can't even outperform gold. It's like terrible. <laughs> it's, 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 it, there's no, but herein lies the opportunity, Tom. Because if you can spot that turn or get close to that turn, even if like six months ahead, whatever your timeline is, and you're not over leveraged, you have the generation, you're going to, we're going to be living a turn of when, when you look at the charts and you say, oh, how come I didn't get that 2000 uh, turn for gold versus US equities? Well, everybody was saying it was a rock back then in 2000 mm -hmm. gold. And it was super hard for anybody to put money in gold because your neighbor's going to laugh at you, right? Hey, you put in gold, man. You should be putting it in a dot com or like whatever it was at a month, you know? So we're, we're, we see it around us, right? Like complacency, the US market. Nobody's ever seen it crash. Uh, it can't go down. The, the Fed's going to save the day. Uh, I don't know the narratives. They're 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 a million. But I think I think you know an, uh, another way to look at this, Patrick, would be to be less married to the idea of 
let's say only gold or only silver, right? As investors, we should be looking at opportunities regardless yeah. of you know, what we believe in. Like, I don't ever want to look personally at gold as a religion, right? I want to look at how can I make the best use of my capital? And, you know, you talk a lot about the weight of evidence. Well, the weight of evidence is very strongly in gold's favor. That doesn't mean you cannot have, you know, a couple thousand dollars yeah. in some, you know, in, in Bitcoin or Ethereum or, how you know, some you? other... Some, <laughs> What? Some, some other, you know, project that uh, maybe you believe in the fundamentals of as well. Yeah, from from yes. a libertarian standpoint, I I I really like the idea of cryptocurrencies. Anything that gets, you know, my my hard earned equity out of you know away from these centralized systems is a good thing to me. Yeah. Do I think it's the end all be all? Time will tell. But. I've brought up the analogy before of having many buckets of assets to be able to soak up some of this liquidity that's raining down on us at this point. And to be super religious about only one asset, I think, you know, kind of does does you a disservice sometimes. Yeah, it does. And I think I'm trapped sometimes a little bit with that because of uh, maybe my persona on Twitter and pe like, People, oh man, if I just bought silver I, I, since uh, August 2020, I, I'm down. And they, they assume, because I don't talk it uh, like uh, open, you know, on North Star Bad Charts, we have, uh, we own these lists, like stuff that I actually own. Like, I don't tell people like what I own. So, okay, I love silver. I, I, I like, I, I study it a lot. I study gold. I study precious metals, the sector. But what do you know? Maybe, maybe I do own Bitcoin. Like, like nobody's uh, seen my portfolio, you know, like you said, it's, uh, you're right. You can't be, you can't, you can't be, you can't be religious about uh, anything. And I think you told me there before there, there was uh, you had one of your podcasts where uh, it was the, uh, what was the, the carbon credits? So another mm -hmm. sector where you could have made tons of money, right? Like I could have looked maybe at the racial charts, see if that was a, a good play to do. But if you're right, if you're too focused on just one thing, you're going to miss the highways of a whole bunch of stuff. Cause I remember like when I was um, deep diving, like precious metals, uh, Kevin, this Patrick, man, look at the uranium chart, man. Look at the uranium chart. It's hitting the, my right side of my arc, man. We're going to be millionaires. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kevin, cool. Uranium. All right. It's fancy. It has a nice logo. Uh, Duke Nukem, but I, 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 <laughs> you know, I'm human. Like yeah. I'm spending time discovering the precious metal sector. Stop distracting you for uranium. And I love the chart and bit, even Bitcoin, like you, he was covering uh, Ethereum at two, three hundred. Was hitting the right side of his arcs and Bitcoin. Patrick, man, and he's buying all these bitcoins and all these cryptos and all that stuff. He he saw that, and uh, I did a few uh, Ethereum charts and I said, "Yeah, you're right, Kevin. Look, it's uh, it's breaking out. It's going to go. It was two, three hundred, uh -huh. and then it went up to I don't know. To, to I had a target at twelve hundred and it went to four thousand. That's again like." All these opportunities are there all the time and people have to understand where the low risk opportunities are versus the high high risk and again if you want an alternate if you're an austrian uh austrian economics guy or you you like alternative type of sound money fine but the value the 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 value of the the instrument that is going to take away from fiat let's say you want to put bitcoin to, to store the value if Bitcoin's worth sixty-five thousand or dollars or one dollar, it's still the same thing. It's bringing to you. It's it's helping you put that money aside. People think because it's worth more on the stock market that whatever it is has more value. No, it's it still has the same more value. It's just that the speculation or whatever it is, the market's pricing at a higher price, right? It's like your house, it's the same house, four bedrooms. If it's worth a hundred thousand or one million, it's still bringing you, Tom, like. The same uh, commodities, right? The, the amenities, the you know, take a shower, have a kitchen. So people shouldn't attach the price tag that the market puts on something for you personal use of that item to be diminished or or not. Like if Bitcoin goes to one ten dollars, if you love Bitcoin, great. Don't don't give up on it. It's still doing what it's supposed to do for you, right? Or like a deflation event. Let's say we do the Harry Dent thing and we go down to two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, gold's still gonna. Protect my purchasing power. I'll still be able to buy a fancy suit with my gold, right? It's just it's going to cost less money, right? I'll still be able to buy the same stuff I stored. So don't be attached. I think people are attached, Tom. If I take a step back, because 
they that, have leverage they have a leverage level. play or bias because they bought here and they're hoping the price goes there and then they're putting their emotional attachment to where whatever it is or well, has to you know it has to go up for all these reasons because but i don't know what, what would do, be a good think, way to see this? I, well, I, I was going to say, right as you're saying that, Patrick, you know, attaching an emotion to a, a particular price level, let, let's say whatever it is, hits $20 and you're not going to sell until it hits $20. Well, if it hits $19.50, you're, you're so close to that $20, you don't take any profits and then you ride it all the way back down. That doesn't make sense. So you know, how do you think about, let's say, layering out of, of out of a position and, you know, not trying to get captured by FOMO and, and to chase things? Well, yeah, well, there's, there's like some of the techniques there I use there, um, that distance from the moving average there. Mm-hmm. So whatever, it, it's so tough because the, the later you get into Let's say I look at a chart. Let's say somebody mentions me, like let's say Kevin mentioned, uh, let's say Bitcoin back in the uh, just nine thousand dollars when it was about to break out. It was it was consolidating for I don't know how many years. It was super close to its one year moving average. I nobody was talking about it. Everybody like Peter Schiff is going. It's crashing, man. Even like it's nine thousand, no four thousand, and then it's worthless. But you were the, my distance from the moving average. You were so close to the one-year moving average, and you were just trying to grind up and breaking above uh, diagonal trend lines, and it's coiling tight. That was pretty much a fear entry where you could have put. That was a time to enter, right? Nobody was talking about it. As it explodes, as it distances its, its away, and all the fear of missing out goes up, and the distance it away from that one-year moving average. If you get in higher up, further away from that one year moving average, it's super tough to sell when you should sell because you still want to squeeze more profits out of it, right? So you're kind of trapped. So let's say I bought Bitcoin, it was super stretched from its moving average at 55,000. And then it goes up to 65. Oh man, I'm not even doing a one bagger, man. Like all these people in the past, they, they, they wrote it from nine to 50. They did, Michael Saylor's telling me I could do 10, I did five bagger, man. I'm so good with Bitcoin. And that's another thing, like bring me back on track after this tangent, a reputation of something, if you, it's built on previous price action and not future price action. Mm-hmm. So people, when they say they love Bitcoin and Bitcoin did a 10, 20,000 percentage gains, well, that's not you that did that. If you're on the sidelines hearing about it, that's somebody who bought in 2011 at one, well, I don't know, dollar, two dollars, and he wrote it up. And that kind of built like a reputation of money-making reputation, man, best returns since ever, you know? I guess that's what's been lacking gold, right? <laughs> in a bear market to have that reputation. But often when you hear about something, you often hear of its past um, reputation or performance, right? And you think that's going to continue continue upwards. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to come back before I get too lost. So now if you bought it in early, it's a- easy to sell. So if you bought at the correct time, close at when you're moving average, when you're stretched away from that when you're moving average compared to previous times in the past where it was that stretch, it's kind of easy because even if you know you're stretched, you see on the chart, I have to sell, I'm stretched, it's time to, to, to scale out. You don't mind scaling out because you, you went up fivefold, right, in your profits. But if I get in halfway in or close at 55,000 and you're stretched and you see in the chart, oh man, I bought... I was so stretched and you still can't sell. You still won't be able to, um, to start rotating out. Okay. So I think I just explained emotionally why it's hard to get out of a trade. The, the further in the rally you get in, Mm -hmm. but definitely when you're far away from the moving average or when you're moving average based on previous price action, uh, behavior. So let's say on the previous bull run and and Bitcoin, it, it got, 400% 400% above its one-year moving average, and you see that happening again, definitely, 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 if uh, you should take uh, some profits. Mm-hmm. And so, if it goes up higher, it, like that's that's nothing wrong either. As long as you respect your trading framework, it's fine. And, you know, you and I have have spoken before about, um, I think it's actually Kevin's chart, is the, the cyclical nature of Bitcoin, just as, again, to take that as an example. Adding to your weight of evidence, you know, where we're at in the cycle, where we're at from the moving average, 
this is this is all you know pieces of the puzzle that you want to let's say check off before you decide to to put some money into a trade. So how do you think about how many you know pieces of evidence you want to be able to have and to check off before you get into a trade and how much cash do you want to kind of keep on hand at all times to to give yourself a sense of comfort? Well, yeah. So that's why you you have to you have to be able to um, before you, let's say you're on the sidelines, you always that's like the number one thing. I always the first question I ask myself: Am I buying at the best time possible? Because charts will be able to give you, in hindsight, of course, but it will be able to give you pretty pretty good accurate see where the low risk opportunity was versus the high reward in your favor, and. Let's say somebody. Let's say I'm on the sidelines. I never heard of Bitcoin. I'm new. I just opened an account. I look at the chart, and then somebody teach. I, I don't know about Kevin or or me, and I, I I see I see that I'm far away from the ideal entry point, which was after a huge base again, like around nine ten thousand when it exploded up. That that's gone. That 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 entry is uh, is far gone now. Now the price action went up. It's consolidated. It's close to its uh, one year moving average. It's still not the best uh, low risk entry right now, especially when I see, let's say in the weight of evidence, I see the Russell having a hard time versus gold. And um, which for now, my theory is uh, that Bitcoin will roll over at the same time when the NASDAQ really falters versus gold or gold when gold starts outperforming. Uh, when I add all that evidence, even if I see a breakout on, on Bitcoin, what am I going to do? I'm going to go, let's say I go from 60,000 to 120,000. I have a measured move. Okay, one bagger. But my goal is to get off these huge bases where I'm able to spot uh, five, six, eight baggers, you know, from a lower lower entry point, higher up. And to, yeah, for, for the cash, honestly, psychologically, it's tough to do because you want to be fully invested to really like, I want to squeeze that lemon and make a whole bunch of money. Mm-hmm. But uh, if ever there's a drawdown, you always want to have that security of having that cash. Mm-hmm. I don't know how, like, I'm not a financial advisor, so whatever you guys yeah. decide. But knowing that you have 10, 20% cash on the side. So let, let's say you analyze and you know you're right. Let's say you're, um, we're just starting, uh, it's a gold precious uh, bulls, bull era. We're just starting to outperform the NASDAQ, full steam ahead. And then there's a Harry Dent. Sorry, Harry, like, I don't know you, but there's a deflation event and gold goes down. Like we saw in, but in March, March, 2020, right? You and I were talking about this before we hit record where, man, it would have been nice to be able to see exactly to, to have seen that coming and to be able to, to have bought in at that time. And, and, yeah. you know, to, to be able to manage that fear of like, this is probably a good entry point. And I remember one of my favorite lines, I've repeated it often from Ronnie Stoferle was let's leave the bottom picking to the proctologists. I think, I think that's a, that's a, a great way to think about it. Nobody, we should worry less about picking the exact bottom and think more about finding a good place to enter where our risks are low and the the evidence is on our side yeah yeah and it, it, it's so tough right so if there's another march that that happens and even if like you you know in the long trend it's good because if you look on the i think on the on the yearly chart the 2008 crisis for gold you can't even see it you can't mm-hmm. even it's like when it went down and by the end of the year it was back march madness i think in one month or two you can't even on the quarterly chart you can't even see gold uh, going down it's like a it's nothing. It's it's just a straight line. But if you have no cash on hand, and you start thinking about your wife making the payments, what if I have to take out the money to, uh, I don't know, to pay the bills? I lose my job during that time. You're gonna start liquidating your your stocks. So even if the premise was great, you're gonna be selling them cheap to somebody else who knows the big picture that, hey man, I'm still at the low. Even if it goes down, I'm still at the low point versus the reward. So that that kind of hurts not having the cash on hand. And if if we want to do against uh, Ronnie's uh, proctology uh, analogy, then yeah, buy bottom pick. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, but at least you have that. Yeah, that you have that option. The worst thing again, like let's say for a boxer going to a boxing match and his left hand hurts, and then he can't use it the whole match. Then he's like handicapped, right? He's he, he he's a victim to his lack of uh, uh, of tools, right? Even if he doesn't want to throw his left hand, he doesn't have it. 
So keeping that cash on hand, definitely a great emotional buffer to, to have that in your arsenal. Mm-hmm. So Patrick, when you hear people making calls for certain things, you know, $200 gold, just as an example, or $100,000 Bitcoin, does it take away from their call when they don't tell you a, a particular time frame, like that this should happen by this time? Otherwise, my my conviction in this trade is lost. How, how do you feel about time frames? Well, I think everything, everything is defined by time frame. And I think through charting, I learned that is somebody could be bullish on the daily chart. Somebody could be bearish on the weekly and bullish on the yearly chart, all for the same instrument. And everybody could be right. Everybody in those, because things go down. And then when they go down, then they hit a, a higher time frames uptrend and then they bounce back up and it just fluctuates like that. So, and that's the toughest part because when people who aren't looking at charts and they, they give a call, let's say he says $200, but what is he talking about actually? That's a question everybody should ask before acting on anything that somebody says. Oh, uh, Patrick says a $100 silver. Okay, fine. But did, did you see what the, was the premise for that call? Did I require, a, let's say, a monthly close above $28 to start enacting the, that target? That's like the first step. Like when is that target... Uh, going to be uh, triggered. And after that, if somebody says, um, yeah, that $200 time frame, are they talking about a spike down? Oh, it's just going to be a deflationary event. But uh, I believe in the in, in uh, six months after that event, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go back up. Or else you're going to live in fear because any one element, let's say somebody, you're going to go, oh man, uh, it's deflation. Okay. I'm, I'm, if somebody thought about deflation since 2011 in the stock market, because you're going to think 2008 is going to happen over again. Well, they missed they miss the, whole, the whole bull run, right? They didn't buy anything. They missed the Tesla run. They missed like all that stuff because they were afraid of one element of what one person said, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess that could work in the, in the inverse uh, situation also, right? For a bullish target, uh, you can't just take that into a vacuum, right? You have to ask that person, okay, what's your time frame? Uh, what's your weight of evidence? Uh, do you understand that there's a mid, uh, mid-cycle lows, right? Like of, of, it's going to go down here. And you could start better understanding the landscape of the, I like calling those actually a Tom roadmaps. Mm-hmm. I, when I draw a chart, I never tr- draw, well, sometimes I do it. I do a straight line, but I try to do a, like a zigzag where I think it's going to hit resistance and support. So if you could visualize it when you actually have the pullback on that resistance line, and then you go down, hit that support line, it's expected to some extent and it's easier for you not to sell all your shares and panic selling when the price goes down. Say, no, no, look, I'm hitting that right side of that arc. It's going up. It's a higher low. And um, it helps you buy in those areas where nobody wants to buy. It's red day after day, everybody's selling. And it helps you you know, flip the script. Instead of being part of the cannon fodder, the crowd, you're actually on the other side and you're just waiting for, for those, you know, those technicals uh, to, to play out. You know, Patrick, when we get to certain price levels, you have a great way of of showing that on the charts where you you chart the volume on the right right side or the left side. So, you know, those those are important psychological barriers. And again, that that helps you add to the weight of evidence of, you know, this is probably going to be a, a pretty solid resistance level because there's a, a going to be a bunch of people that want to get out of their shares at, you know, the $30 level, whatever that is, right? Yeah. It's a uh, man. I can't believe charts. Like I'm a chart geek, man. I wish like everybody look at charts like, like I did, but he, that, that volume profiling, even if you do, if you didn't know TA, cause I think a uh, classical charters, they kind of see it like, you know, the, the saying, the bigger, the base, the higher in space. Well, a huge base. That means it's going to be a lot of people are going to be transacting trading hands in that, uh, in that area. So the longer that base ranges, all the, all the bag holders that bought much higher in the previous bull cycle, went down when that base over the years there's no sellers now everybody's buying it let's say the range is from 10 to 12 dollars everybody's buying in that range so when the this overhead supply actually uh, disappears and the price action breaks out there's like kind of a vacuum i call those like reverse symmetry moves like mm-hmm. huge volume for that base and then if you look on the right hand side there's like practically no volume because rel- relative to that quantity volume that was in the base on the way down, there's like almost no more people. So that the price just gonna it just vacuums up, right? Until you reach uh, 
where people have their price targets, you know, the people that bought the bottom, when the price went goes up five, six times, they're going to start, okay, I'm going to start taking profits. And then after that, you start creating a new base or a, a new top, a new volume defined profile uh, node, which could become a launching pad for the next level up. But if you can't um, break above that next uh, volume area, then the price action could actually go back down and retest uh, the base. So that's that's really why, you know, you you pay so much attention to TA, right? Because it it really is human psychology, and it is you know basically in, encapsulates all of the the FOMO, the trading mentality, all of these all of these different factors, even even the manipulation to some extent, because you're analyzing charts with manipulation over many years. So. Do you do you think that that the charts give you, you know, a, a let's say an eighty percent approximation of what's probably going to happen? Well, yeah, I think so. So the the higher the time frame, the more probable the the moves. So it's super hard. You get a lot of hate when uh, there's down weeks, down months, or down the quarters. You know, but the the bigger you step back, the macro tidal waves. That they're driving these equity flows, especially like I, I go back to the gold to Nasdaq ratio or uh, inflation cycles or Fed fund rate cycles. Those huge, huge tidal waves when they create moves, they're they're long term, they're meaningful. It's because the pendulum of of these ratios of these equity flows it takes ten years to, to to swing in one direction and then ten years in the other. People they forget. So I'm new to trading. The pendulum's here, it's swinging in my favor, close to the end, and then people forget that hey, one day it's going to swing back on the other end. And, oh, it's going back here. I don't understand what's happening. Oh, what's happening? What? Gold's outperforming equities. What? How could that be? What? What? And then when they flip the script, I'm going to buy gold. Well, it's too late, guys. It's, it's time to load up back on US equities. Mm -hmm. So when I look at charts, honestly, I always try to find tools to visualize this emotional stuff there. This I don't know how to call it. Uh, emotional profiling through charts. Mm -hmm. Always try to spot how emotions are rampant, like how I could spot them in the chart to help me deal with like my own emotions there when I'm uh, when I'm uh, trying to buy when nobody wants something, right? Because it's yeah. honestly, it's super hard to like even gold, even if it's all time highs, it's still getting a lot of hate. Oh, it's entering a bear market. It's over. Jesus, man, <laughs> it's, a it's a tough crowd, but that's also a good opportunity probably. <laughs> so contrast that to, to silver for us. You know, I asked, I asked Jeff Clark this question the other day, you know, if we look at, if we analyze the, the 1980 high for silver, you know, the, the $50 silver level, um, or even if we go back further before that, when the, the Hunt brothers squeezed silver, is that a fair approximation or is that a fair comparison for where silver should be today versus, you know, us looking at being, $250 below gold's all-time high right now. Uh, I think so gold, I think right now gold is exactly where it's supposed to be. Silver still has an arbitrage play to catch up to gold because on each in every single bull cycle that gold did a new high, silver eventually within nine months to 43 months, the one of 43 months that was interrupted by the GFC, silver always does also a, a new high. But you got to be careful with those spikes for silver. It's in its DNA to, to go crazy, ah, crazy spike, fear of missing out, the, the best trade ever. But if you put it on a yearly chart, silver, and you try to reduce that noise of that spike, because you got to remember, if we, we didn't stay there long. So how meaningful is a $50 spike if it's a, like a melt up of sorts where practically only nobody was able- Maybe a week or a yeah, day, so right? How meaningful is that in the long term? So if you put gold, uh, silver on the yearly chart, it never closed a year above 31 so for me, when the silver was at 29, we're practically at 1980 highs. Uh, and even right. in 2011, we never close above uh, $31. Mm -hmm. So that's why silver right now at 20, 22 or 25 or whenever it was close at, it's within striking range of exploding out of a 50-year base, yearly defined. I have some cup in hand. Like, that's what people have to look at. Forget the wicks, the euphoria, FOMO. Look. I practically might not even be able to sell on that. I'll be so, so hyped up when yeah. we go parabolic. I'll think like uh, it's going to the moon, you know? So if you tone it down, yearly closes, 
uh, silver's 30 bucks, man. We're, we're right there. We're so close. So there's an arbitrage play to, to, to catch up and get our yearly defined all-time highs. And uh, after that, uh, rocket ships, man. I'll be putting rocket ships on all my charts. <laughs> Patrick, <laughs> you know, when, when we talk about that as well, you know, even just having, let's say, silver closing, you said it didn't ever close above 31 for Never, yearly, close. yearly close. Yeah. So when when we think about that, how do we adjust for inflation and where should it be at that point as well? Do you, do you ever adjust for inflation when you're looking at that? Well, I don't, I'm trying to honestly, like I'm having brain freezes trying to wrap my head around. So right now I've been inflation adjusting the U S dollar and the, the, my rationale was, it was kind of, it's like a purchasing power, right? So if you're fiat currency, I inflation for adjusted even. So that's like the, per, like, you remember, you see that chart out of the U S dollar called purchasing power. And it's like a U.S. flag yeah. behind it and it goes down or I did infl- inflate adjust the, 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 the silver chart. And of course we're, we're, we're awful. It's like super low. Like it's uh, the breakout line is like even 2011, I think it never went back to, um, and gold barely, I'm not even sure gold where, where it is inflation adjusted. It, it could, it's, it's probably, I think it might be above there. I'd have to recheck. But what the odd thing is, it's, the actual silver or gold chart, not inflation adjusted, they look like the US dollar inflation adjusted chart. So I'm trying to wrap my head around that. I think the reflection of the inflation is the actual price that we see here, that the price we have now is the actual price. It should be your value, your stored value. It is what it is. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough sometimes because sometimes I do some racial charts, Tom, and I don't understand what I see actually. And sometimes I do some racial charts and I realize, Patrick, man, that's, you did a ratio of a racial chart. What the hell are you doing? That doesn't make sense, you know? Yeah. But uh, as a chart trader, I'm just trying to see patterns, fractals that repeat within the same chart. But now I'm starting to see stuff and like trying to put pieces of the puzzle together where I'm able to talk without looking like a total newbie. But maybe in two years, we'll say, Patrick, you were so, so wrong. I'm sure your some of your fundamental guys say, Patrick, what is this chart trader? Stick to chart trading. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> stick, but, uh, stick to your Bitcoin charts, Patrick. Well, guys, <laughs> the Nasdaq turns versus gold. We'll see who has the, the emperor with no clothes. We'll see. <laughs> well, I, again, that comes back to what you and I were talking about before the the Dunning Kruger effect, and yeah. the uh, the chauffeur knowledge. So to to kind of wrap up wrap up that point. Um, there was a story in the in the book, I believe it's called The Art of Thinking Clearly. And I brought this up before we hit record because we were talking about analyzing our good trades as well as our bad trades. You should be analyzing your good trades because maybe you did just get lucky, right? Analyze your your success just as as strictly as you would analyze your failures. Figure out why you got it right and what you actually got right about that call. But the um, the chauffeur knowledge piece was there was a a story I believe it was from Charlie Munger brought it up, and he was saying that there was Max Planck uh, was touring around Germany giving lectures, and one day his chauffeur had attended every single one of the lectures, and his chauffeur said, you know, I bet that I could. I could actually give deliver the lecture just as well as you could. I've heard you deliver it many times now. So he said, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. <clears throat> so the next city they went to, the chauffeur put Max's suit on, got up on stage, delivered the speech like he knew what he was talking about. And nobody was any wiser because nobody knew what he, Max Planck looked like back then. So at the end of the lecture, somebody stood up and asked a question. And the, uh, the chauffeur said, I can't believe that you, you know, in such a sophisticated city like this, that you would have um, the audacity to ask such a, such a simple minded question. I will defer to my chauffeur to answer that. And then Max Planck answered the question. So that's, that's the story of, of uh, chauffeur knowledge. It's yeah. secondhand knowledge, right? So dangerous. So dangerous. I'm a victim to it. And that's, look, there's great guys on Twitter. I, I snoop around. That's why I keep a minimum of follows in my Twitter because it's not that I can't learn from people, but I've realized that I need I need to, to figure it out like myself. You know, I know sometimes I do something like I say, hey man, I, I look at that chart. Oh, cool. I'm super happy to see somebody else that came up with like I did. I don't think I'm inventing anything with any of my charts, but 
I'm trying to, I, I don't I didn't even know about this theory, theory until you told me like before the, the, the podcast there, but yeah, I don't want to fall into that. And for me is to do my own homework and guys, that's a great lesson. Don't, mm-hmm. don't, don't buy on one guy's tweet, please. Or on one guest or whatever, please do the research. It's your hard, hard earned money guys. Do, do, do the research because, and even if you, yeah, it's, it's tough, man. Like, it's uh, when the, the capital flows are going to start turning away from you and you won't understand what's happening. Uh, it'll be this, that despair curve, right? The, uh, oh man, what's the name of that, that curve? The Dunning-Kruger effect? Yeah, that one there. That, yeah. that, that, that's epic. Yeah. I think eventually as, as gold investors, our, our patience will pay off. I, I'm just as guilty of everybody else being frustrated by the, by the price action. I don't have any better answers than anybody else. You know, it, it was brought up to me recently that the market not seeing interest rates or gold reacting to inflation, sorry, the way that it it has traditionally done. You know, there, there's a million reasons you can point to. I don't know exactly the reason that gold isn't going up, but at this point, for for whatever reason, there's many people that are voting with their dollars that Bitcoin is more valuable. And as as you brought up earlier, and I, I spoke to another guest last week that said, you know, I want to see Bitcoin really go through a bear market where there is real panic in the markets where nobody knows what to own. And there's just a flight to the safest things that they think they can they can own. I don't know if Bitcoin survives that test. Well, I don't want to be a Bitcoin basher, so I'll refrain from talking. I'll just be a chart <laughs> trader. Right now, the lowest entry, guys, we missed it. 9,000 Ethereum, 3, 400. Look at the charts there. Yep. We, I, I post on Twitter. Now, uh, I know Kevin's tracking it there. He'll, he'll tell us when, 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 when it's game over. He yep. still has some higher up targets. But for me, uh, doing a 10 bagger on Bitcoin, it's, uh, you're, you're, it's done, guys. Forget yep. it. <laughs> and that's the thing. I, I'm not saying that Bitcoin won't be that store of value. It, it could I, still I'm be. Absolutely yeah. not saying yeah. that. It could be worth three thousand and still be a store of value. Sure, like absolutely. And that's the thing. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that it's that it's overvalued or whatever. I'm just saying that you know we have five thousand dollars, five thousand years worth of history to go go on with gold, whereas with Bitcoin we don't have that kind of history. What? Well, they have a nice logo that looks like a gold coin. It must <laughs> be worth for something. It's it's the new gold, Patrick. Don't you know that? I'm too I'm too old now. I'm too uh, I'm I'm part of those. Uh, I'm too old. Well, that that uh, that Santa Claus beard is coming in nicely. Oh, so man. you're playing the part, guys. Guys, guys. I, I was gonna call my dad to be the Santa for the for like last year he came over to be Santa <laughs> for the kids. Yeah, uh, man. If I don't cut it for for end of December, I'm I'm good. I'll do it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Patrick, is there anything else uh, you want to cover before we wrap up here? No, man. I'm a. It's old school talk, uh, Tom. Man, really appreciate that, and I hope uh, people find value there in my uh, in our conversation like that. There, there's there's way more than just charts, and don't hang on any one of my charts or like for anything to to, to put all your life savings, guys. Like, I know it's tough there, but um, just uh, try to figure it out yourself. There, you'll you'll enjoy the journey. Absolutely, good. Uh, yeah. Good, good advice there, Patrick. Of course, you're uh, at Bad Charts One on Twitter and yeah. uh, NorthstarBadCharts.com. Yeah, go check Perfect. it out, guys. Kevin's arcs nine times th- nine times out of ten they work. Nine times out of ten, <laughs> go check it out. Perfect. All right, guys. Thanks. Well, yeah. Let us let us know what you uh, let what you thought of the the conversation, and yeah. uh, maybe we'll have another one like this, a little more informal. Cool. Perfect, Patrick. Thanks for your time today, man. Thanks, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.